there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Here we're in Chihuahua, a city in the North Highlands of Mexico. I'm about to take the famous El Chepe train that leaves from here to Los Machos on the Pacific coast. I'm a little tired because it's very, very early in the morning, but look, the train station is already very busy and it's only 5 a.m. Good morning. Good morning. Is it here to go to Los Mochis? Yes. Which compartment? El Chepe is a mythical train in Mexico, a mixed country. One of the most beautiful railroads in Central America that comes down from the highlands and the Sierra to the Pacific, passing through mythical lands such as the Tarahumara. It's 630 kilometers of lifeline that Mexicans love. Here we are. I can feel El Chepe like a beast getting ready to take off on the rails. So it's really taking its time warming up. It's pretty early in the morning. It's quite noisy. El Chepe, a colorful character. The train we are on is the only passenger train in Mexico. I meet numerous travelers, discovering the railroad for the first time in their lives. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Uh, can I sit here? Of course you can. Of course you can. <laughs> Are you going to the canyons or...? We're going to Divisadero. To Divisadero, okay. Yeah, it's part of the Barrancas del Cobre. It's a big city too, right? Yes, very beautiful city. It'll be our first time there. Uh, the first time? Yes, the first time. With the children, the girls? Yes, the children, family and friends. What is your profession? I'm an accountant, a clerical job. And you? Me too. You too? Okay. What's your name? Ah, Olivier. And what's yours? Daniela. Oh, Daniela. Why, there aren't many trains left in Mexico then. Because back in the day, the train was the only means of transport. There were not as many roads as there are today. It used to be economical, but nowadays with the roads, the planes, they left the train behind. It continues to be used as a means of transport, just like El Chepe. But we're not going as fast as we would on the road, by plane or by bus. And is it expensive to travel by train here? No, it isn't expensive. But it's cheap then. Very cheap. My daughter had never been on a train before, and she wanted to. It's the first time. It's the first time, and she's thrilled. What do you think about the train? Is it nice? Yes. Yes, it's nice. Very nice. Shall we go get some breakfast? Okay, let's, let's have go. breakfast. It smells good in here. To be a restaurant waiter here on El Chepe, you have to be very flexible and very fast. And you have to have sea legs because it's moving all over the place. It's not just a kitchen door, it's a prison door. Because there are really some well-kept secrets in there. The Mexican food that they make here on board and elsewhere is one of the best cuisines in the world. And it's also part of the intangible heritage of UNESCO. It's one of the few who hold that title. Yeah. 
It's a fantastic train and it's very important for the country. Yes, of course, especially since it's the only passenger train in the country now. Uh, how many years have you been working on the train? It's been 15 years. Uh, 15 years. And life in Sanalo and Chihuahua is quiet? There's nothing to worry about? It's like everywhere else. So far, so good. There were cartel wars before, right? Uh, is it over? Mm. Is it still going on a little bit? Well... In this state of Sinaloa, is it still going on? He won't say anymore. It's true, we're in the realm of the drug cartels, where the railroad crosses the perilous paths of man-made paradises. A subject that remains taboo in a country that is certainly bubbling and teeming with life, but which values silence above everything else. Where are you going? You're going to Las Machas? No, Boichivo. Ah, Boichivo, yes. We're going to explore. Is this the first time? Yes, it's the first time. We decided to travel by train because we're a group of friends from secondary school and we're traveling together. At secondary school? Yes, from secondary school. It's been a long time. <laughs> it's been years. <laughs> So, for Mexicans, the only way to travel by train is El Chepe. In Chihuahua, yes, it's El Chepe. Huh. Uh, what does El Chepe mean? From Chihuahua to the Pacific? From Chihuahua to the Pacific. That's El Chepe. <laughs> A lot of Tarahumara Indians live here, don't they? Tarahumaras? Ah, yes, and Mennonites, too. And what do Mennonites do? Agriculture. They produce apples, cheese, and things like that. Huh. They're very important to this state because they are very hardworking, and they contribute a lot to the economy. They produce a lot. For the entire state of Chihuahua? We're in Coatemoc, right? Yes. The Mennonite town? Mennonites, yes. Bye. Bye. Coatemoc is a small town in the highlands where there lives a singular and rather closed community, that of the Mennonites. Men and women who came from the Netherlands at the beginning of the 20th century to live their Protestant faith and to become Mexicans. Hello. Hello, Abraham. Welcome. Thank you. This is the Mennonite community here. Yes, that's it. And your community wants to live like the old days. You don't want to live in the modern world? Yes, there's already too much modernity. When I grew up, everything was very different. My father and I worked with horses, without electricity. We live happily and we're at peace. How many Mennonites are there in Coatemoc? In this colony of Manitoba, there are approximately 27,000 of us. In the state of Chihuahua? Yes, in the state of Chihuahua. Is this the barn here? Yes, that's where my cows are. The white ones give the milk and the black ones the meat. Do Mennonites have a lot of cows? Not anymore. And not so much anymore. Why? Not as many as we did because we don't make enough money for milk anymore. Why do you still have cows then? To preserve the culture. That's how I was taught to do it. And to occupy the mind so you don't just sit there. You're very liberal, so do you think it's time to open up the Mennonite community? Yes, it's going to open up. But we're going to lose our customs, our culture. We're going to lose them. 
Little by little, we are losing them, especially when the young ones go off to college. It's a good thing that they're studying, but from that moment on, these people will hardly want to become peasants who cultivate the land and animals. Uh, if I understand correctly, you think the community should preserve the mentality of the old times, the very original way, is that right? It's already very complicated. There are families who have a lot of land and others who have very little land, and that difference is not good. I think we should work more in community. Here, everyone works independently. Oh, so there's no cooperation or help between each other? Only when there's an emergency. I set off again on the famous train pulled by a 13,000 horsepower locomotive through landscapes of canyons and otherworldly highlands. A trip under high-level surveillance to prevent any attack on the stagecoach. Hello? Uh, uh, you're well armed? Is it to protect the travelers? There's no risk here, is there? No, there's no risk, of course. It's because we're here. But we need protection all the same? Yes. Uh, during the whole stretch? Okay. But, but why, though? It's prevention, nothing more. It's safe. It's so they don't come back. Okay. Are you guards? Do you work for the train? Yes, yes. All right. But it's totally safe. Yes, it's just prevention. Thank you. <laughs> 86 tunnels and bridges in abundance on an 18-hour trip. I can see why it took over a century to build. The line is one of the most spectacular railways in the world, with so many places and scenery branching off it. I was going to say hurry up, but no, the train will stay a long time in this station. It's very late, but it's also a chance to meet some local people. I'm in a small place, which is a very important city for the Tarahumaras Indians, who, by the way, I'm going to meet tonight at the bottom of the canyon. Indians live in pueblos, villages which often look like they did in ancient times. Some of them welcome travelers in sacred valleys. Hello. Hello and welcome to the hotel. Thank you. I'm Olivia and you? My name is Porfilio and I'm here to take care of you. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, this is the bedroom? This is the room. Look at that. It's beautiful. Yes, there are oil lamps. We don't have electricity. Ah, there's no electricity. For total rest. Huh. In order to live like the Tarahumaras. That way you're immersed. <laughs> and the waterfall is that way? The waterfall is in that direction, three kilometers away. You walk through the little door. Ah, well, I'm going to take a walk. <laughs> See you later. Here is the Kasurare waterfall. It's a very important place for the Tarahumaras Indians, which the poet Antonin Artaud wrote of in the 30s. So, what does Kasari mean? Kasari is the place of the eagle because the Tarahumaras Indians protect the animals that are practically sacred to them.
The kitchen is also the place of survival in Indian culture. Let's take a walk around this farm before dinner. Good evening. How are you doing? What's your name? Marda. Do you do traditional cooking here? Yes. At our Humaras meal. What are we going to eat? Stuffed chilies. And is that a meal, which is typically indigenous to this area, the Tarahumara area? To the village? The village, yes. And can I help you? Yes. I'll put some cheese here inside, right? It's chili with cheese, which is produced here in Chihuahua or Kutsarari? No, in Chihuahua. Like this? Yes. Ah, no, there's a little bit missing. And he has to be well coated and breaded. I can't promise anything. I don't have Marta's touch. Tarahumara cuisine is both very simple and sophisticated. With natural products, cheese from the land, chili, not chili pepper, but rather red or green peppers. And eggs and everything is raw and then soaked in oil with a little bit of cornmeal. And also from here. And what are we going to eat tonight? A rice? Rice, stuffed chilies and pumpkin soup. Ah, that's sweet. No, that's a cake for dessert. Okay. Thank you, Maria Marta. Authentic Tarahumara cooks who love to pass on their knowledge. I was very happy and quite moved that they taught me their secrets today. And that's important because this community of East Indians is threatened not only by the rural exodus and globalization, but also from deforestation and certain trafficking activities in the region, which ultimately threaten, undermine and damage the perception of Native American culture in the highlands of Mexico. Thank you very much for this meal. A little bit more? And Martial? The train isn't going for a while. The next one's in three days. I decide to go deep into the Barrancas, these canyons which are very isolated, discovered by Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century. You finally arrived. Hello, Ivan. Nice to meet you. How are Fine. you? Fine, how about you? Ivan is a Mexican traveler who came back to his country and decided to live in the Sierra among Indians. We follow the Ambition Road. As I was telling you, this road was designed in the 70s. Why is it called the Ambition Road? Because it was a government project to connect the Barrancas del Cobre with the western Sierra Madre, then the capital of the state of Chihuahua, and then on to the Pacific. Ah, to the Pacific. We're not connected to the Pacific yet. We're about 200 kilometers short. This is the heart of the Tarahumara people, isn't it? Yes, this is where the Raramuras natives lived. And what is the current population of the Tarahumaras? 100,000. What is their way of life? They live a life which is very integrated life with nature. It's self-sufficient. The Raramuras sow their crops and live off them all year round. They grow corn, pumpkin, beans and potatoes. They own a few donkeys, goats or cows. They do not use money. The Raramuri lives a very different life from that of the Mestizo, although they're part of the Mestizo anyway. Humans need to accept each other, otherwise there would be no possibility of survival. See, when there's any problem in the Barrancas del Cobre, for example, on the road, pretty soon someone stops to help you. Life here can be harsh. The climates are extreme.
Is it unusual here, Ivan? It's true, Olivier. It's a magical place. And sacred lands, too, right? Sacred ground for the Raramuris. What is the significance of this place? The beginning of life. Fertility. Here, Olivier, once upon a time, we had a large flat-topped hill, which over time has collapsed, leaving these rocky and capricious shapes exposed. What do the Uraramuris call this place? It's called the Valley of the Sidiriachikis, which means the Valley of the Erect Penis, for obvious reasons. It is also called the Valley of the Monks, which is more politically correct. It's a place of meditation. Native life is cyclical. Human life should be cyclical. But for some mysterious reason, we're forced to follow a line, a timeline. We have to accomplish goals and be the first to do so. Being first, being better than the others, and this crazy race is wearing us out, killing us. And it also alienates us. The Raramuris are in no hurry. Time means nothing to them. Things keep repeating themselves over and over again. It's Mother Nature's command. Agriculture is cyclical from one year to the next. It is the same thing. Is that why you want to live here with the Raramuris Indians? Mm. Indeed. Huh. It's important then to learn the values of the Indians, their culture. There's a lot to learn if you go back to the origin of things. And this is the origin of life. Do you want to live here? Yes, this is where I want to exist. Nothing more than to exist. And for you, the silence is important. Ah, yes. Yes, you have to hear the silence. Mm. Silence whispers, and it whispers wonderful things. In the wind, you can listen to the silence. That's it. We must walk in silence, like the Raramuri. Here we breathe. Is it a sacred place? Yes. It's a place to discover yourself. Life in Indian villages seems to have remained unchanged for ages. The Indians took refuge in the Sierra Madre precisely to flee Western civilization. Ivan's right. The silence here is golden. The poet Antonin Artaud said that the time among the Tarahumaras Indians inherited from an ancient pre-Columbian culture took on a whole new dimension. He found there, in the heart of Mexico, a new idea of man. How are you, Ramon? Hello. 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 And the boy? How is he? He's fine. We're all fine. Hello, Olivia. Nice to meet you. He's from France. <laughs> My boy is very quiet. <laughs> like all Raramuris. So here we are in a completely Raramuri village. Yes, the Tarahumaris, Raramuris. And we're at high altitude, no? No less than a thousand meters. Yes, more or less on sea level. It is one of the most authentic and traditional communities of the Barrancas del Cobre. We are in the heart of the Barrancas del Cobre. It is a magical place, the last bastion of indigenous culture. Is it a tradition to make violins? Yes, we use them for parties, although sometimes I sell them too. For the Semana Santa, for the 2nd of December, we play, we dance. Can I see the workshop? Sure, let's go. Okay. Ah, is this the workshop? Yes, this is my workshop. So this is where you make your violins? Ah. Yes, I make violins here. But I like to play violin too. I do crafts, some drums. So I'd like to work with you on a violin a little bit. Would you teach me? All right. I was just in the middle of sorting this out. I'll show you.
How long does it take you to make a violin? This type of violin takes me 20 days. 20 days? Yes, to finish a violin. Can you play a little piece for us? Yes, of course. The Tarahumara Indians speak little. They have the mountains to themselves and eternity too. In search of their roots, they are immersed in a true rebirth of the Amerindian nation. Magical land, where the spirits of the ancestors float above the eagles. A great lesson in wisdom that shows you the way. I'd forgotten about the railroad. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is the El Chepe train that's coming? Uh, yes. What's fantastic about the train is that you get to meet Mexicans. Communicating is very easy on the train. It's easier for me to communicate with the locals. Some of them think I'm Mexican. <laughs> Aren't you Mexican? No, I'm Peruvian. Ah, oh, you're Peruvian. What, from Lima? Yes, and I'm taking advantage of this moment of freedom to make the trip aboard the El Chepe because it's a great opportunity. This train is an icon. I searched the internet for the most beautiful train journeys. And El Chepe was one of the best, the top ten. What's good here is that the price is affordable for tourists. It's a reasonable price. It also makes it possible to talk to the locals and through its wonderful landscape, discover Mexico. Although when you come to Mexico from somewhere else and you're taking the trip on El Chepe, the landscapes are so different that you think, oh, but this isn't Mexico. <laughs> We're somewhere else. Oh, I think the train is coming. Yeah, thank you. It was nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. At the front, there are the yellow cars, the luxury class, first class, and the red are economy class, which is pretty popular. We're going to try and talk to the real Mexicans. I'm heading back to the highlands. It's time to head down to the coast and its ocean, the Pacific, which is a long way ahead. What a show. You don't even have to move, you just stand at the window. Don't stick your head out too much, though. And look, the mountains and the valleys, the barrancas, as they say here, the canyons, all seen from the train. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How is the food? Yes, very good. It's chopped chicken. And where are you from? From Chihuahua. Ah, Chihuahua, the state capital. Ah, very nice. Yes, El Chepe means a lot to the people of Chihuahua. And of Sinaloa as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's really important. By the way, there are people here from the region, the Tara Humaras, who have the ways to make the travel cheaper. Okay. It's a government grant for people with little income, for the Tara Humaras. You see, there's a train on the bridge. Ah, yes, I see. Accreditation, economic and social rate. And there's no way everyone has that card, is there? 
Well, I learned something today, which is that the people who live on the line of the railway, and especially those who are in territory, Tarahumar, have special prices for train tickets. They are very cheap, less than half the normal rate, and all this is open to the country's Native American areas. What's the next stop? The Visadero, Barrancas. The train will stop for a little while, so that everyone can come down to eat and enjoy the fabulous scenery. Thank you. Have a nice trip. Goodbye. Hello, Gustavo. Hello. How's it going? Ah, great. You're in paradise here. It's true. It's paradise. I came by train. Is El Chepe coming all the way here important for the people of the region? Certainly, El Chepe was originally called the Pacific Chihuahua. It was originally designed for goods. Nowadays, it carries not only tourists, but also us, the people who live here. It is both a tourist train and a local train, and it is still used as a freight train. And so it continues to be very important economically. There are also a lot of treasures here, right? There are precious stones. Yes, absolutely. Here there are semi-precious stones. In this zone there are opals. In the back we have some chalcedony, also known as fool's gold because it is stone-filled. But we also have great mineral deposits. Mm -hmm. And copper. And the copper is still being mined. We can see the color of it. Indeed. In some places, the rock is green because of the oxidation of the copper that's present in the rock. It's a huge geological complex due to a combination of phenomenon. The tectonics, the volcanism, and the erosion. 90,000 million years ago, it was the sea. The movement of the tectonic plates created the place where we are right now. You can see La Mesa de las Estrellas. La Mesa de las Estrellas, the table of stars. Yeah, it makes sense. The sky is pure. It's fantastic. And this big rock looks like a cathedral. You're right. Actually, some people call it the altar. Ah, the altar. Yes, but the Tara Humaris call it the tail of the eagle. The eagle's tail. Oh. Hello. Can I come up? Okay, thanks. We'll try. I'm invited on board. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, my name is Americo. Americo, okay. Is it difficult to drive the El Chepe? Oh, it's like any other job, it takes practice. Uh, but there are animals and rocks, no? Possibly there are rocks, but a train is protected by, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, a pickup truck ahead of us. There's always one in front of us exploring the tracks. What's that? Pictures of the construction? Oh, wow, how old are those? 50 years old? More, more. 60. 60 years. Is it important for you to work on a fantastic and historic train? No. This is my second home. <laughs> it's our family's legacy. My father was also a driver, and this is where we worked all our lives. And driving it today is wonderful. A marvel. We take Raul's word for it. <laughs> Immutable Mexico unveils its secrets through the railway. A magical path that is not afraid of emptiness and that uses the heavens to better taunt the abysses. A vertiginous trip in every sense of the word.
I arrive in Baoichivo, a small town at the foot of the mountains, at an altitude of 1,600 meters. The cocaine cartels own the area. We have to be careful. While many locals live comfortably, benefiting from the informal economy, the Indians are satisfied with very little. In the village of Sarakawi, a former Spanish mission has been transformed into a school to welcome the children of the community, who sometimes come from far away to open up to the world without the religion. It's true that the Indians were converted five centuries ago. I can't hear anything. Louder. One. I can't hear anything. One. Two. Three. Let's see, now in English, so that we know that you can count in English. One. One. Two. Three. Well, wait a minute. Good. Just wait a minute. You teach them English too? A little bit, don't you think? And families have to pay little or nothing? Yes, we're looking for a contribution. We ask them for 50 pesos a month for those who can. For those who can't do it, they can do it with handicrafts they make themselves. And those who can't do that either, pay us with corn, with beans or fruit that they sow, and we share it. They help us and we help them in return. It's about empowering families, I guess. Exactly. We're trying not to set them apart because the primary responsibilities for girls' education lies with their parents. That's why we don't want to be commanding with them and only remain a help. There are also a few foundations that help us sporadically and the government is also helping us by feeding some of them. Mexican mountains are shared. They are also run on or danced on sometimes. The inhabitants of the Sierra have been in the habit for centuries of doing everything while running. This has spawned some great mountain marathon runners, like Fabian and Javier, trained by a master of running, Ernesto. Hello. Hello. Uh, you two are runners. Is running a tradition for you? Yes, running is a way of life and a tradition in Tarahumara culture. Them, they run naturally. The Tarahumara or Raramuri, which is the same thing, means light-footed race. It is said that the Tarahumara run to live and live to run. They're strong runners. They're not fast runners, but they have a lot of stamina while running. They're born runners. They don't have any special training or any special diets. They're just going about their normal lives. More recently, they run marathons. Uh, how many miles long? More than 100 kilometers. More than 100? In the Sierra or foreign countries? Yes, in the Sierra. We've also been to different countries. When you're abroad, as in California or France, do you run in your traditional clothes? We always run in traditional clothes. You'll always see very bright colors. And it's because they have a joyful heart. It is part of their culture. Oh, they have a joyful heart. <laughs> Always. There's no sadness or mourning, ever. There's nothing like that in the Tarahumara culture. This is part of the Tarahumara culture. And motivation. Yes, and motivation. Strong colors help with that. How about you, Javier? Do, do you run? Me? No. What, no? You, you don't run at all? I, you don't need it? No, I just walk from one place to another. I go up hills and down hills. Today, I've come all the way here from Uruguay. 
I've been walking since this morning. It took me four hours. Four hours? Four hours. Yes. And this afternoon you'll get back the same way? Four more hours? Yes, yes. Eight hours to see your friend Ernesto and Fabian came with you. <laughs> you got a secret. How did you do that? No. <laughs> These are magical shoes, right? Yes. Yeah, wow, competition shoes. Are they enough for you? Yes. A little bit. Uh, oh, it's, it's a tire. Unbelievable. I'm really astonished and fascinated because, well, so Javier's got competition shoes, but looking at the pair, it looks like traditional sandals worn by the Tarahumaras Indians. And look, they're just made out of old tires. And they work. Yes. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Incredible. It's, it's more than a sport here. Running in the mountains is a tradition, an ancestral rite in the Tarahumaras Indians. Running promotes happiness and with being able to communicate with the sky. But it's also about being able to hold on to a culture that's unfortunately disappearing. Live to run in the mountains and run to live. A beautiful motto that eagles too, the lords of the heights, must love. The magical trip continues like an enchanting journey that never ends. With these unlikely encounters in train stations, its doors open to the world. A trip always under close surveillance, but El Chepe, which is quite a character, loves a challenge and plunges to the other side roads, between sky and tunnels, between light and shadow. Here, I have just changed platforms simply because the train makes a big loop. We're going to take another turn in the valley, if I understand, because we're going down several hundred meters in a few minutes. And the train doesn't like that, so we're going to take our time and take wide turns. Uh, hello. Uh, what's this? It's very good meat. Beef. Ah, beef jerky. Dried meat from Chihuahua. This is dried cow meat. Uh, bull meat from somewhere in Chihuahua. It looks delicious. And what's this? It's meat again, but minced. Oh, so this is minced meat. You put it in soup, it's very good and very energizing, but it's a bit difficult to swallow. It's like chewing gum. Uh, let's taste it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's strong, isn't it? It's very good. I'm putting a little bit in. Oh, that makes him laugh, but it, it's good, but really spicy. <laughs> it's very, very spicy. The sauce, I'm not sure what it is called, has an explosive instruction manual. It, it warms up your heart. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, too. Oh, that's nice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a beautiful sunset, isn't it? 
Yes, very beautiful. Are you going to Los Machos too? Yes. Uh, what for? A, a holiday or...? I'm going to run a stationery store at the university. Ah, and where do you study? Uh, Sinaloa? Yes. But it's a long way from home, isn't it? Yes, it's nine hours away from my house. Uh, can you explain to me what life is like here? Well, here in St. Rafael, it's quite difficult because there's not much work. So most people tend to move around looking for work. It's kind of complicated. After your studies, what field would you like to work in? I'd like it if I could stay in my city and work in ecology. Because we're literally killing the planet. We're cutting down too many trees. Is it an issue here, the ecology, the pollution, the contamination? Yes. You can see it, especially in this area. We're not thoughtful enough. Very few people sort their garbage. So, for example, we're contaminating the water. When it rains, the rain drags all the garbage with it. And it all ends up in the sea, and it hurts the fish. It's a nice country. Do you think we can protect it from the environment? I think we could. Here in St. Rafael, we are very close to Divisadero. There are a lot of tourists there. We have to take care of the environment if we're going to keep them by being responsible. Every time you cut down a tree, you have to plant two or three. People don't do that. They don't realize what they're doing to the environment. Trees and plants provide us with The view oxygen. is really beautiful. Yes, wonderful. With this sunset. Yes. Bye. After its mountain race, El Chepe catches its breath and stops in the plain by the ocean. A well-deserved stopover. This is what you find in Mexico. Old haciendas or Spanish officers' residences, transformed into hostels nowadays. And this hotel is extremely well known and very popular among Mexicans, because it is here that the famous Don Diego de la Vega allegedly was born, better known as the legendary Zorro. It's time to say goodbye to Chepe and visit the god of the sea. Hello, uh, this is a fishing port? We're going fishing. Come along if you want. Oh, really? I, I can come with you. Okay. Is it important that the train stops here for businesses in the area? In reality, El Chepe doesn't reach El Topo. It goes all the way to Los Moshis. But travelers from El Chepe often take a boat from Lower California and go all the way to Los Moshis to take the El Chepe. How is life for a fisherman here? We have good times and bad ones. We just finished the shrimp fishing season. Now all we catch is fish. There is a ban from the government? Yes, shrimping is over. We can't fish for them anymore. Why is that? Because this is the breeding season. Ah, how long is it? Around six months. Six? Six? Six months for the shrimp fishing. Are, are you happy when you fish? Yes. <laughs> Why? It's my job. It's what I live on. If I don't fish anything, I don't get any money.
Where are we going to fish? Uh, here? But there's a powerful current, right? Yes, but where there's a current, there are fish. Okay, but it's very difficult. Martin says that in here, the big fish eat the small ones that are dragged by the current, so they can't escape easily. And the biggest eat the smaller ones. What about you, Guillermo? Do you like fishing? Yes. It's not your profession, though. I heard you're a doctor. If I hadn't been a doctor, I would have been a fisherman. Well, a doctor, that's not bad either. Ah, look, bravo! What's the name of that fish? Pargo or Lassan. Ah, he caught it. The bird caught it. Oh, beautiful. Look, look. It's a kachi, a big kachi. Ah, two kilos, right? Really nice. Oh, nice, four. The fourth kachi. It's half a ceviche, give or take. There's already enough to make half a ceviche, since it takes ten fish like this. Kashis make the famous ceviche recipe, which is in fact a mixture of tomatoes, avocados, but mainly fish and onions. It's delicious. You eat it cold. Tukula Bumbo, finished. Tonight, Guillermo and his fishing friends will not go home empty-handed. The bay is slowly closing its treasures at the end of the fishing line and the railway line, like a mischievous shell. So the fishing is over, so is the trip. It ends here, in this bay, next to Los Machos. It was a great trip. The train, but also because I met people with very endearing characters in this mixed country. This country of different cultures in this land which is still looking for its identity and meeting each other. In any case, from the Sierra Madre, all that there is to say is from the high plateaus to the sea. There are many things to do and this country is calling out to you. I'll see you soon.